sky, to whom do these celestial steeds belong, when you appear to us like gods on high, which brings you here to mystify. Welcome to what might be the last Kate Valentine UFO show on this, the 14th day of December 2012. Here to let us know what our chances are of seeing 2013 is John Ventry. John is very qualified to give us his analysis of these possible impending events as the head of the Pennsylvania, Delaware, and West Virginia Mutual UFO Networks. But more importantly, he is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, as well as The Day After 2012. Uh, he's also written two other really interesting books, UFOs Over Pennsylvania, and, and I'll probably massacre the pronunciation of this, John. Apophysis, was it? Or, uh, <laughs> Apophis. <laughs> Apophis. Thank you, John. Well, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem. Well, first of all, let's just get back to your one book, The 2012 A Prophecy. How did you first get interested in this? What, uh, what, what did you first hear? Of, when did you first hear about these Mayan prophecies and all the other end time prophecies? Yeah, you know, I was uh, as a kid. I always heard about this December twenty first date. But what happened was uh, back in nineteen ninety six. I was doing a lot of traveling. I was a security director for UPS, a state security director, and um, I was traveling for eighteen months straight. And it was really boring, and you know, staying in hotels. And I don't drink, so uh, <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I said, you know, I really I want to write a book." And uh, so I was thinking, what can I write about? You know, and I said, "Well, you can." You know, Y2K, but I said, you know, that's only like four years away. I don't know that I can get a book done. I've never written one before. So I was racking my brain, and I said, you know what? I remember hearing about this Mayan thing, this 1221 date. That gives me plenty of time to get a book done. So I started researching it in 96. And, uh, I mean, it was amazing. The more I looked, I came across a lot of other type of prophecies from different cultures, different people. But uh, actually, the most significant thing of this research for me mm -hmm. is it got me involved in UFOs. Oh. I had, I had, you know, because you know, a lot of times people, if I'm on a UFO show, they'll say, "Well, you know, were you a big UFO fan as a kid?" Nope, <laughs> never was. Oh, <laughs> you know, so I'm probably one of the few out there who wasn't into this topic of UFOs as a as a kid. Uh, what got me involved in it was doing the research on 2012, and when I came across different prophecies. You know, where these different cultures like the Dogen, uh, the, the Tibetans, the Mayans, etc., they're talking about people from the stars, people coming from other planets, uh, you know, flying around on flying shields and flying wings, you know, because they didn't know how to describe it. Uh, I said, you know, there's something to this UFO stuff. You know, I was always a big sci fi fan and more into like comic books and, uh, you know, horror conventions, but. Uh, so I started looking into it, and then I joined MUFON two years later in 98 and became their state director a couple of years later. So I've been with them for uh, almost 16 years now. Yeah, you certainly went right into the deep end of the pool. That, yeah. That's for certain. Uh, and, and you've given so much credence to the field, too. Uh, you, you know, you you come off very much as the businessman that you are. And again, as one other credible speaker for the field, that sometimes gets put down a little bit too much, I think. But, uh, but you also uncovered, uh, well, first of all, what always struck me is, and I've been to some of the conferences where you are a speaker, and, and the one thing that struck out uh, to me was the fact that the Mayan calendar begins at the end and then goes backwards. Yeah. A and, you know, why that culture should have picked that particular date, uh, that that's pretty interesting. Well, yeah. Oh, well, you, well, you know what, what happens is uh, television, everything in our society right now has to be uh, exaggerated, you know, it's the media effect and all of that. And, you know, a lot of these TV shows are are hitting on this end of the world thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Mayans never said anything was going to happen. They never said it was the end of the world. But they, what the media is really, really missing, because they have to sensationalize everything, is what you just said. <laughs> I mean, these are Stone Age people over a thousand years ago, I think it was around 980 uh, A.D. that they developed this uh, calendar. So you got these Stone Age people 
who happen to get all of this scientific data correct. And the real question is, where they get it from? But nobody asks that question. All the, they concentrate on is saying, well, the calendar ends, that's got to be the end of the world. The Mayans didn't say that. What they did say was that we're on a cycle. This will be the end of the fourth cycle and the start of the fifth cycle. And December 21st ends, uh, I guess we're in the age of Pisces right now, and it starts the age of Aquarius. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they got the zodiac, the astronomical signs correct, which last 25,800 years. But, but here's the thing that, that's, that's really important when you look at this. They did exactly what you said. They picked the date of December 21st, 2012, and they worked backwards to create this calendar. So the calendar runs from, I think it's 3114 or 3113 uh, B.C., to 2112. And let me, let me correct something right now. Okay. A lot of the, the bunkers, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be on a big radio show here in Pittsburgh, KDKA uh, Radio, next week. Ooh. And uh, when, I, when I heard the show a couple of weeks ago, some guy calls in and he says, oh, let me tell you all this Mayan stuff's bunk and I'll tell you why. And I wasn't on the show. I tried calling in to straighten <laughs> this guy out. And uh, he says, well, um, leap year was created by the Romans. So since the calendar starts in 3000 BC, they got it all wrong. It's off. And my, you know, the guy, the guy running the, the radio show don't know the difference. He goes, oh, well, that's a great point. So I, I emailed him, and uh, he's going to have me on the show next week on the 21st, and I'll straighten this out. But here's the answer to that. So that sounds really good that they created leap year and the Mayans got it wrong because leap year was created in the middle of their calendar. But it wasn't because they, they started with the date of December 21st and worked backwards. They didn't create the calendar in 3000 B.C. and go forward. Do yeah. so you see what I'm saying? Yeah. The leap yeah. year thing doesn't apply because they, their calendar came afterwards. 900 years after leap year, the calendar was created, and, and, and they took all of that into account. So from that point, you're really going from 950 or 980 you know, A.D. to 2112. But, but here's the thing that's the most important uh, about the Mayan calendar is uh, they had three calendars, and I want to concentrate on the one. The one calendar is 5,125 years, which if you go back that time frame, you're really at the building of the pyramids and Stonehenge and that type of uh, architecture. But I want to concentrate on the one calendar that's on a 25,800-year cycle. Okay. Okay. That's and, good. And this, and this is why, and I don't understand why the media and people aren't picking up on this point, is that they created this calendar, right? Uh huh. They're Stone Age people. All of a sudden, they, uh, they, 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 they're building expansion bridges. They're doing dentistry. They have mathematics, astronomy. They get all of this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But, but their calendar is on this twenty-five thousand eight hundred year cycle. And the planet is also on a 25,800-year cycle. There is no way that these Stone Age people a thousand years ago could figure this out. Exactly. And, and, and what I mean when I say the planet is on a uh, 25,800-year cycle, what happens is uh, as the Earth rotates, it, it's, like a, it's like a top that wobbles, you know, because it's not perfectly round. So the planet wobbles, and every 72 years, it changes by one degree, all right? So, and, and, it, it'll, and the planet will kind of rotate, you know, maybe 10 degrees to the left, and then kind of go come around a little bit to the right. And uh, I, I'm, not cer- I'm not 100% certain that it does a 100% flip over 25,800 years. I think it kind of goes maybe 30 degrees, and then comes back 30 degrees. But the, the point is, if you're looking at the sky, like right now, you don't see the same sky that the Egyptians saw. And I think everybody knows that. When the Egyptians built the pyramids, they lined the three pyramids up with Orion's belt, the three stars. Well, those stars are not above the pyramids anymore because every 72 years, the planet changes one degree. It rotates one degree. But the whole point is, it takes 25,800 years to complete one cycle, one rotation, and you're back where you started. 
<laughs> Nobody has been able to tell me how Stone Age people can figure that out. They would have had to have, they, you know, they have these uh, observatories down at their temple of Coco Khan and all of that, right? Mm-hmm. And, right? And you can stand there and get it, you know, it's like you stand there and you, there's a slit in the ceiling and you can see a star. Right. Okay, so what do you tell me? For 72 <laughs> years they stood there and then they said, well, look, it moved one degree in my whole lifetime. Uh-huh. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh-huh. So, so, like, maybe after three lifetimes, 221 years, they say, well, look at that, that's a three degree difference and you could actually notice that maybe. I doubt it. I doubt so, it. Yeah, I doubt it, too. But So here's the question. How do these Stone Age people know that the planet is on this rotation that takes 25,800 years? And the other thing, too, is at the end of that cycle, which is also the end of the Zodiac cycle, when the sun rises next Friday morning at 6 a.m., 6.20, whatever it is, when the sun rises and you look at that sunrise, we are in the exact center plane of the Milky Way galaxy when the sun comes up. We're right in the, in the dead center, uh, which happens every 25,800 years. See, now that should be headlines and not yeah, the fact that not. Lindsay Lohan had another traffic accident. Yeah, I mean, that's and, a big and deal. Even, <laughs> even when they talk about the Mayan stuff, they keep yeah. saying, well, you know, I, saw, I was at the gym this morning, right? Uh-huh. And the TV was on, so I couldn't hear the words, but they were talking about... I could sort of, sort of headline is the increase in natural disasters all part of the apocalypse it, it, of what's coming? You know, and I, I didn't have headsets on, so I couldn't see what they were saying. But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is the Stone Age people mathematically, astronomically figured something out. They also wrote in their sacred text, the uh, Popol Vuh, that there's a dark rift in the center of the sky. Wow. So for about hundreds of years, nobody knew what the hell that meant, <laughs> you know. But you go back to maybe 1970 or so, 1982, I think, with our telescopes, we found a black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Well, how they knew that, perhaps you can tell us after a quick commercial break, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Kate Valentine here. I'm speaking with John Ventry. He is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, and its follow-up book, The Day After 2012. He's also the director of the Delaware, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia Mutual UFO Networks. You can address your comments to John now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. After the show, go to his website, John Ventry. Entry V E N T R E dot com. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show on 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is John Ventry. He is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, as well as The Day After 2012. John can address your questions and comments now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. After the show, you can go to his website, John Ventry, V-E-N-T-R-E, Dot com. So, John, just before the break, you were talking about this, um, that the Mayans had uh, perhaps not discovered, but became aware of this dark rift in the middle of the galaxy. Yeah, So, uh, so but nobody talks about this. Well, the fact that they discovered there's a black hole in the center of the galaxy, and the fact that they figured out that the planet is on a 25,800-year rotation. So wh- wh- where do you think they got it from? Oh, well, I know where they got it from. Ah, and that is? And that is Coco Khan. Now, uh-huh. when, you, when you look into their history, what they say happened, and I, I think it was around 980, 986 uh, A.D., uh, this guy shows up. Right. Okay. He comes. They said he kind of just walked out of the ocean Mm -hmm. onto the shores there, down by Guatemala or down in Central America, where they're located. Uh, Actually, down by uh, Cancun, it would be, because that's where the Temple of Coco Khan is. And he came walking out onto their shore into their community, and he's a Caucasian male with blonde, long blonde hair, blue eyes, and an elongated skull. Hmm. Okay. He's the person that gave them all of this knowledge. He said he was from the stars, and he showed up there. 
He gave them their uh, mathematics, their engineering, their medicine, their dentistry, and their astronomy. So he told them all about this because there's no way you could know there's a black hole in the middle of the sky. I don't know it's there by looking. And there's no way you can look at the sky and know that the planet's on some sort of crazy rotation. It would be impossible to know that, you know. But that's where it came from. It came from this guy, Coco Khan. And uh, what they did was, and you see this in a lot of other civilizations, when kids were born, they would strap those boards onto their heads and try to elongate their skulls because they were trying to emulate this god that showed up on their shore, you know, in their community. And what he had said was he would return in 500 years. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, Cortez shows up, who they mistook, mistook for the return of Coco Khan, and, uh, you know, the leader thought it was the return of their god, Coco Khan. So, you know, and then Cortez, you know, pilfered their gold and brought diseases yeah. with them, and it was really the Aztecs at that point, because the Mayans were they're there, but they weren't a huge uh, society yeah. anymore. They had fallen apart. But, but it came from Coco Khan, and, and this guy was an extraterrestrial, and he left. And, uh, you know, because you, you figure they had never seen a white person, and that's how they described them, Caucasian, blonde hair, blue eyes, but with a, this elongated skull. And that's the thing that you find really interesting, is because we we're not born with elongated skulls. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, do you think that uh, when he uh, gave this date for them to count backwards on the calendar, was that possibly a warning, like when that date occurs, uh, head for the hills sort of a warning? Or was it just, look, this is the cycle, and once that happens, and you're going to go into the next cycle and reset the calendar at that point? Yeah, it just it resets. Now, whether okay. he meant that to be a, re a warning or a return of his people, well, it's never said, you know. Um, but, um, you know, he, pretty much the way the, the Mayans believe is that everything is cyclical. And you find that, you know, I think in Buddhism and a lot of other cultures around the world who believe in reincarnation and, and that type of stuff is that things go cyclically. It's not a straight line. You know, you're born, and then, you know, if you're an infant and you die, that was it. You know, other cultures believe you come back again. Mm. Sometimes you have a great life, sometimes you don't, but it's more about developing your soul. And, uh, you know, because you live many lifetimes. So, so that's basically what the Mayans were all about. <laughs> it was that this cycle ends, a new cycle starts. Uh, now, some people believe, uh, if, you, if you're more out on, let's say, the West Coast, when I speak out there, um, they're more into the New Age beliefs, and they believe this is going to be a like new uh, evolution for people. That at, at, you know we're going to start evolving into this next generation of human beings. You know, humans 2.0, yeah. where where you know where we're kinder and gentler and have telepathy and, uh -huh. and not as violent and aggressive and and you know that we go on this type of uh, cyclical uh, improvement. But I'll tell you one thing. When I looked up, I said, okay, so it's a 25,800-year cycle. So, you know, my next question was, instead of looking forward to December 21st, mm -hmm. what happened 25,800 years ago? Whoa. <laughs> well, no we were in an books. ice age. There was ah. an ice age started right ah. around that same time, ah. 25,800 years ago. It was also when... Uh, uh, what's he called? The uh, Cro-Magnon man showed up. As opposed to Neanderthal. Yeah, Neanderthals over. were here a long time, you know, in Europe. But okay. Cro-Magnon also showed up. Huh. But Cro-Magnon was only here 10,000 years during the Ice Age. He died out, you know, around 10, 12,000 years ago before the end of the Ice Age. So, I mean, this raises all kinds of questions. If you believe in evolution, you know, I was told... We were, um, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 you know, chimps and monkeys and became hominids who became Neanderthal, who became Cro-Magnon, who became Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I was taught. But, but the Cro-Magnon only showed up 10,000 10, in the middle of the Ice Age, you know, 25,000 years ago, and he was only there for 10,000 years, and he died off. So evolution doesn't go in a straight line. 
like we were told in school. I, you know, I had Tom Fusco on, and he made some really interesting points about it, that, yeah, there is evolution, but there's something else going on, too. Absolutely. Uh, Kate Valentine here. I'm speaking to John Ventry. We're on 1160 WVNJ. John is the author of 2012, A Prophecy. So, so uh, I, I'm sort of not really holding out a lot of hope for a change in human nature, come you know december 22nd but uh you know maybe it would be a nice thing i would think but what gets me too is it's not just the mayans but there were some end time prophecies that sort of fit in with them as well and uh, for example the hopi indians that you discuss yeah that was really sort of interesting and then you get into uh some of the other indian tribes that built their homes way up because they're expecting another great flood yeah um for, for you listening out there uh it's a very interesting history in John's books, and uh, really get a hold of them, read them. I think you'll enjoy them. But w- so, what were the Hopis? What was that? There was the Kachinka doll. Was that? yeah, 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 yeah. I'll tell you about them. But let me let me just tell you okay, one more point sure. on on the Mayans. Sure. Is that, uh, so I went back those twenty five, twenty six thousand years, mm-hmm. and we're in an ice age, right? Okay. So you go back one more cycle to fifty thousand BC. I don't really find any natural disaster, but I do find an Air Force document. It's a chapter that they used to teach their cadets at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs that said that this planet has been visited by extraterrestrials for as long as 50,000 years, and there are three, three or four different species. So that was two cycles ago. Uh, And this was an Air Force manual? Absolutely. Their physics... Wow. It's a physics called Physics 370 class that they taught. They oh. taught it from 1968 to 1970 for three years. Uh-huh. They pulled the course after Project Blue Book mm-hmm. in 1970, said they're not going to investigate UFOs, so they pulled the class. They taught this class for three years, opening chapter, that this planet has been visited for as long as 50,000 years, and there are three or four different species of extraterrestrial and that's a fact. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have that chapter, and, and that's a fact. That's what it says. So then you go back another cycle. So you go now we're back three cycles. Okay. And, and they say there's only this is the end of the fourth cycle, and we're starting the fifth cycle, which means we're ending basically a hundred and eight year, hundred and four, hundred five year um, period, right? So if you go okay. back to the third cycle, there was another ice age. So in two of these cycles that the Mayans calendar goes back to, on two of them, you have an ice age starting at that same time. Hmm. So two of two of the last three, let's say, there's been a disaster, and one of them kind of talks about the uh, arrival of uh, of extraterrestrials. Wow! So, so that was all the interesting stuff on the Mayans. <laughs> but but again, you know, it's. Uh it, it is well. I think what you said that uh, uh, tomorrow morning we're going to be just looking right down the throat of the galaxy. I think that's phenomenal. I mean, that's pretty. Uh, it's it's enough to make you get up early. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to see the sun come up next Friday. You know, yeah. week. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. yeah, and and you know, I was supposed to. I was supposed to be at the Temple of Coco Khan uh, uh-huh. next week. I was invited as a speaker down there. Mm-hmm. And I, I never had a good feeling about being down there on December 21st. But uh, actually what ended up happening is they didn't get enough people signing up for their tour down there, and they asked some of the lesser-known speakers, uh-huh. <laughs> like myself, <laughs> uh, which they got wrong. Well, they said, if you want to fly yourself down and pay to come down, you know, oh. you can attend our conference. I said, no, thanks. Yeah. And, you know, actually, what my answer to, because they have Greg Braden speaking down there, right? So I, I said to the, the guy running it, I said, has any of your speakers, including Greg Braden, ever been on the Anderson Cooper show? And he said, no. I said, well, I was on the Anderson Cooper show back in April. So <laughs> you're cutting the wrong guy out of this tour. Yeah. But, uh, but that's fine. I didn't really, to be honest with you, I didn't have a good feeling about going down. So, uh, so I won't be down there that day. And then somebody sent me a, a picture of the temple getting hit with a tidal wave. So that kind of sealed it. <laughs> 
I said, I'm not going to be down there. Well, I'm glad you'll still be with us then because we've got to take a quick commercial break. Uh, Kate Valentine here. I'm speaking to John Ventry. He is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, as well as The Day After 2012. If you have questions for John, post them on our website now, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. After the show, for more information on these and John's other books, go to his website, John Ventry. V-E-N-T-R-E dot com. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show, 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is John Ventry. He is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, as well as the day after 2012. Uh, John can address your questions, your comments now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com or after the show, go to his website, John Ventry, spelled V-E-N-T-R-E dot com. Uh, John, during the break, we had an interesting question that came in from Dale, which would sort of lead into your second book. Uh, If 12-22-12 is a new age, what will a new age bring? Or is it just a change in dates based on the Earth's position in the galaxy? So, uh, I, what, well, first of all, why did you write the day after 2012? That's interesting because. Uh, well, yeah, w- what happened was I, uh, I gave my 2012 presentation uh-huh. at two different conferences. They were like two weeks apart. And in both conferences, somebody stood up and asked the question and said, well, what are you going to say, Mr. Venturi, when nothing happens on 1221? <laughs> so, you know, right away my answer was, well, I'm, I'm currently writing my new book called The Day After 2012. And everybody laughed. Uh-huh. But when I said it the second time at the second conference, I said to myself, you know what? That's a pretty good title to a book. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's how I ended up writing that other book. But, you know, that book uh, really deals with um, a, a catastrophe, which was an asteroid strike. Mm-hmm. And you know, and just kind of a scenario that could take place after that. So um, you know, so that's that's what was in that book. But uh, you got, getting back to that question, um, there's a like I said, the new age people. I mean, if nothing negative happens, let's say there's no super volcano or asteroid strike. And you, did you notice Monday there was a news report that on Saturday uh, or Friday they discovered a asteroid that just missed the Earth. Yes. With two days' notice. Yes. So, so much for the sidling space observatory and all of those (laughs) that are tracking these asteroids. Uh They had two days. And luckily, that asteroid was 150 feet. What if it was a three-mile asteroid or, or, you know, a two-mile or one-mile? You know, that, that, that worries me. That stuff, and I even told some people, asked me, and they said, how do you know there's not more of them trailing that one? That mm-hmm. was the first one to come by. Maybe there's another one on Friday. I don't know. <laughs> you know? And an even bigger one. But well, yeah. At, well, at one time, uh, I read an interesting article, and it said the number of people tracking near-Earth uh, objects are less than the number of people in your average McDonald's. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's a little scary, too. And then, and here I go, slaughtering this name again, Apophis, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Now, that was fascinating, too, because that came very close, and that's a huge thing. And, yeah. and, and you know, this is the thing that keeps coming up too is, I, you know, I, I like that, that asteroid Apophis, right? Thank you. Because every seven years, it gets closer and closer to mm-hmm. Earth. So that mm-hmm. got my attention. We discovered this thing in 2004, and it passed by in 08. Mm-hmm. And, and then, uh, and actually what happened was, I was in my office in 2008, and I told everybody, when this thing comes by on Friday the 13th, ah. <laughs> and, and it always passes by on Friday the 13th, Does April, it? Friday really? the 13th. I said, look in the papers, you're going to see all this, all this information on, on this asteroid, right? Mm-hmm. There was nothing, nothing written about it. Mm-hmm. And it comes back again in 2015, 2022, and then 2029 is when it actually, it misses us by 22,000 miles. It actually dips below our satellites, which are at 25,000 miles, and it passes by at 22,000 miles. And that's if nothing changes its 
trajectory. Because let's face it, all it has to do is hit a pebble out in space. Yeah. And it yeah. could change a hair, and a hair could be 20,000 miles when it gets back here. So, uh, so, but the thing that happens is, like, they'll, they said, well, that asteroid that passed by, nothing, you know, missed us by that, you know, and there's nothing else going to pass us that close. And I keep saying to myself, how do these people not know about Apophis? And this has happened over the past couple of years, three or four asteroids that passed by, you know, maybe on the other side of the moon, you know, it was, uh, you know, whatever, 50,000 miles, 200,000 miles away. And they keep, they never mention this other asteroid that's coming closer and closer and closer. And it's a half a mile asteroid, which would take out a small country, uh, would take out the whole northeast. Actually, the trajectory is into Nigeria on uh, Apophis. If it did hit, it would take out the entire country in Nigeria. Well, you know, I, I, I think, though, that, uh, you know, possibly the governments are not going to mention this because if there's nothing they can do about it, uh, which is what everyone says about, uh, you know, this so-called doomsday coming up next week, uh, you know, if you can't do anything about it, why get everybody all upset? And uh, You know, it's great that you said that. Uh-huh. Because at some point during this hour, I was going to interject this. Okay. And I'm going to tell you something that I believe is the absolute policy of governments, mm -hmm. and it was said by the Church, by the Vatican. Okay? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm at the Ohio MUFON conference. This 82-year-old guy, you know, wobbles up to me on it with his walker, and he says, Read this book. Here. Keep it. It's called The Fatima Secret. Fatima, remember the three girls? Sure. They got sure. the, the, the uh, vision, uh, et cetera, and they mm -hmm. never released the third prophecy. So I'm reading this book, right? Mm -hmm. I get to page 166, and this is what it says. On October 1990, October 13th, the anniversary, you know, it's kind of funny that that was on the 13th also with Fatima. Was on the thirteenth. How do you like Something that? Something about that number. I don't know. Yeah, it was October thirteenth. Uh -huh. But it, this is nineteen ninety six. Cardinal Ratzinger is the Vatican spokesperson, and he finally gives a statement from the Vatican on the on the you know on Fatima, right? Mm -hmm. It's the seventy ninth anniversary. This is what he says, and I think this applies to ufology. This applies to any natural disaster. Okay, he says when one reads that the oceans will flood entire portions of land, that human beings will die within minutes and in millions, oh, yeah. then one should not desire publication of the secret. Knowledge means responsibility. It is dangerous when someone only wishes to satisfy his curiosity if he is not prepared to do something about his discoveries or if he is convinced he can do nothing to prevent the prophesied disasters from happening. Wow. There is your policy statement right there. And, you know, I can't say that I disagree with it either. Uh, yeah. Uh, Kate Valentine here, I'm speaking to John Ventry. We're on 1160 WVNJ. Uh, I really, it, I, I like that aspect of responsibility because there are... Uh, you know, in your the day after 2012... You saw, or actually in 2012, a prophecy, you envision that after a huge, huge natural disaster, that we will rapidly go back to a feudal or a tribal state, mm. that the force of law will dissolve. And uh, I, I think I have to agree with that vision, unfortunately. Yeah. But, but here's the thing that happens, and uh -huh. it's actually in that book, the newest one I wrote, Apophis 2029, mm -hmm. in, in my version, there's a second asteroid trailing Apophis, oh. bigger one, okay? But what happens and what would happen with any uh, natural disaster is the government will continue to go on with their policy of continuity of government. They have these deep underground military bases and bunkers, a select group of people in every country that have these, you know, their politicians, probably the CIA, FBI, those type special force people, Scientists will be taken down into these bunkers. So they're going to gather up 100,000 people to survive, and they're leaving the, less, the rest of us on the surface with no preparation. Mm -hmm. And then, whatever, a couple of months later, they're going to reemerge. Okay. So I, so I kind of have an issue with not telling us that some, you know, maybe there's not a lot I can do. I'll go buy more ammunition and some bottles of water, and at some point we're all fighting for survival. 
So it is probably, from the government's point of view, there's no reason to tell anybody. But, you know, from our point of view, if we're left on the surface and you do have a First Amendment, it was the law that you have to tell us, but you didn't. And uh, I don't want to give away my, my book there, but at the end of the book I can tell you the survivors are staked out with bulldozers, cement trucks, et cetera, <laughs> at that opening where they left us here and they went down under. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you anymore. <laughs> I can sort of picture it, though. Yeah, can't uh, they leave us on top and save themselves, and then we make sure they don't get back up again. Okay, well, that makes a great time to uh, take a quick break again, John. Of Kate Valentine here. I'm speaking to John Ventry. He is the author of 2012 a Pro- uh, Prophecy, The Day After 2012. If you have comments or questions for John, you can post them now on our website, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. After the show, you can go to John's uh, website, John Ventry, V-E-N-T-R-E.com. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Cape Valentine UFO Show, 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is Mr. John Ventry. He is the author of 2012, A Prophecy, and The Day After 2012. He has a lot of other interesting books on his website, John Ventry, V-E-N-T-R-E dot com. Please go there. So really, uh, whether you agree or disagree with the 2012 prophecies, is some very interesting facts in these books. I think you'll enjoy reading them. Uh, you know, John, I, I was just before the break, you were discussing whether or not governments and religions would uh, release information of an upcoming doomsday or not. And I, I was thinking of Ronald Reagan's uh, speech to the UN in which he said that perhaps we needed an outside threat to bring humanity together. I, I, I think everyone's initial thought about knowing that an asteroid was about to hit in two weeks would be that they just go crazy wild. But uh, do you think that after the initial shock that you would be able to bring people together to sort of offset this natural dis- these natural disasters or not? Uh, do you have uh, just a total um, total black view of humanity or do you think there is some hope for us? Well, people want to see leadership. Yes, and okay. if you if you remember uh, during nine eleven, the government's procedure to keep the president safe was to keep moving him around, mm-hmm. and that didn't go over very well with the people. You know, they shot, they picked him up at that school where he was talking to the kids, and they flew him to one Air Force base in Nebraska. Then they flew him to another one to keep him on the move in case this was an attack by you know the Soviet Union or China or somebody, so that they couldn't get the president. Right. So. And and that didn't go over with the public. What went over well with the public was Rudy Giuliani being down there in New York Mm -hmm. with a a little white mask, you know, with the firemen (laughs) and stuff. People want leadership. And if there's anything I learned from that, that might have been the government's policy to keep the president safe. It was not a good policy for confidence and and for the people to stay calm. They want to see their leaders in times of uh, crisis to be out there in, at the front and not hiding in some cave with, you know, with a uh, you know a monitor and an American flag behind you, you know, giving a press conference when you're a thousand feet on the ground. Right. So, um, you know, I think the government does need to be there. But the, you know, the whole point is, can you communicate? Depending yeah. on what yeah. the situation is, uh, you know, our magnetic fields are at their weakest point right now, and solar uh, flares. Uh, you know, uh, electromagnetic fields hitting our, uh, you know, our uh, planet right now, or uh, uh, there, the flares are strong and our our um, our magnetic fields are weak. I mean, that would fry all of the computers, all of our communications. You know, any sort of EMP would take that out. So it really depends what it is. You know, and this, you know, I tell people there's three real scenarios that aren't prophecies. Okay. You know, they're real, real things that could happen and one day will happen. One is the, um, what I just said, a solar flare hitting directly at our planet. And if it's when the magnetic fields are weak, 
it's going to take out all our electronics, and then you, you're going to lose all power for months and throw us into feudal times. That's one possibility. And that actually happened in 1859. It fried all our telegraph lines. But we didn't have phones and, and, you know, generating electric and stuff that we had to worry about all of this. But nowadays it would cripple us. Uh, The second scenario is an asteroid strike, which, you know, we talked about, and I talk about that in my books because I kind of lean towards that because it's a surprise that just happens. And, you know, with asteroids... Any asteroid, an asteroid has to be over one mile in size to affect the planet. Like a poppet is a half mile, that would take out a small country. You know, a mile wide asteroid, when it hits, actually changes the atmosphere, the environment, you know, would pretty much take out, you know, would take out the better part of the United States if it would hit. Um, anything over three miles, I believe it's three, three or four miles, I believe it's three miles, is a uh, extinction event. Mm. So the one that hit with the dinosaurs was six miles. Wow. So that's, I mean, that's just some facts on asteroids. I actually learn a lot about different things as I research and uh, I write these books. And the other possibility, so that's two that could happen. The third possibility is the supervolcano. And that one just scares the heck out of me uh, because there's seven supervolcanoes in the world. Three happen to be located in North America. Two are right on, like, the Mexican-U.S. border, down by Arizona, uh, Nevada, and then and they're not active right now. One is located at Yellowstone Park, and it is very active. As a matter of fact, it's 40,000 years overdue for blowing. It blows every 600,000 years. It's been 640,000 years. Mm. That, there are times when there's... Tremors, I, I read in January, there were 21 tremors down there at Yellowstone. Uh, the ground swells up six feet in certain places. Uh, there was one point where there was a, a lake, small lake, the ground swelled up, the lake moved over, <laughs> and all the trees were underwater. So Yellowstone, is, you know, it, and it's probably the only thing that could take out the United States, because mil- militarily nobody matches us, you know, even China, what they're doing. I I read the USS Ronald Reagan has as much firepower as the entire country of China. So uh, nobody on the outside is going to take us out. Um, But the one thing that could uh, take us down is a supervolcano. If it blows, it leaves eight feet of ash. All those states get covered in eight feet of ash, and it's really the acid rain that comes afterwards around the entire planet killing all the crops, all the plankton. Uh, And what happens is 90% of all life dies after a supervolcano. And that's a fact. The last one that blew was the one in Indonesia, and it blew 72,000 years ago. And the gene pool, and the biologists will tell you this, 72,000 years ago, the gene pool shrunk down by 90% around the world because there was no food. You couldn't grow anything. You couldn't drink the water. I mean, it's horrendous. Yeah. Well, and yet you say that governments have possibly prepared for some catastrophe along these lines with the seed banks and the underground bases. And Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, uh, we built around the world 1,400 seed banks. And the interesting thing was they had to be finished by 2012. Oh, and geez, they're, they're, you know, what's funny. <laughs> I mean, they build them. They, 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 here are the rules. Mm-hmm. It has to be 300 feet above sea level. Okay. Because if all the ice in the world melted, sea levels rise 220 feet. Uh. That's a fact. If all the ice melts around the world, North and South Pole. So they have to be 300 feet above sea level. They have to be stored at minus one degree, and the seeds will last uh, a thousand years. And they they even say it's because of a natural disaster, a nuclear strike, that type of stuff. So they not only build seed banks, 1,400 of them, around every country has them, England also has a DNA bank Hmm. that they built where they have DNA from every species, every creature on the planet. So, you know, it's kind of like you think of Noah's Ark. Yes, really. uh, (laughs) You know, and and I've said when that movie 2012 came out, if they had any imagination, I could have given them a lot better storyline than what that movie was. At the end of the movie, I would not have been bringing two of every animal onto those ships. I would have, I would have shown a lab that had little vials labeled yes. lions, tigers, bears. Uh-huh. And we have the, we have the DNA uh-huh. on them. 
to recreate them and clone them. That's what should have been done. But, you know, you have the deep underground bases. you got seed banks. you got uh, DNA uh, storage. So the plans are there. But the whole point is, you know, continuity of government. Remember that. COG, C-O-G. And okay. you can look it up. You can Google it. You know, people should Google before they giggle because <laughs> all of these things are out there. And, uh, and that's out there. But the select few are going to be saved. You know, I'm 55 years old. Nobody's saving me. <laughs> oh, I don't know, John. I think you'll be there. I, yeah, uh, it, I'll be here with my guns, my 90-pound Doberman, <laughs> <laughs> and my guns, and I'll be looking for food and water is what I'll be doing. Okay, well, your address is off our list, then, I guess. You're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we had a... Uh, uh, to make the mood just a little bit lighter, Steve said in a comment, he said he was wondering if Pope John Twenty-Third was privy to the Fatima le- letter because he heard that the Pope cried after reading the letter, and then someone said it was because it was the bill for the Last Supper. So I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I, I, you know, I think uh, really the head of major religions are, in a sense, the heads of government, too, and mm. they also have to prepare for that uh, I, as well, because people, you're right, they look to leaders, and I, I think if we are to survive some natural catastrophe, I think you're quite right. We need some very strong leadership, someone that will get up and say, you know, look, you can max out your plastic, but there's nothing left to buy, so you mm. better get real and start planting some seed banks and some food and water because that's going to be a lot more important yeah. than a 60-inch TV set. Yeah. Well, you know, if you go to the FEMA website mm-hmm. and you look up, uh, you know, the plans for, like, uh, natural disasters and prepping and all of that, it says right there on the website, there are 310 million people in this country. We cannot protect all of you. Uh, oh. You know, we can per- we can help. <laughs> you know, we're lucky we can help a million people. Uh-huh. And I'm paraphrasing, and it uh-huh. basically tells you what you need to do. You need to store water. You need to store food, and then rotate that food and eat it. You know, so it doesn't stay there forever. Right. And it, it gives you a whole list of things of what you need to prepare. Have batteries. You know, rotate everything. Have water. Have uh, purification systems. There's, there's this, and I have this stuff. There's uh, little pumps you can buy where you can take water, and then you put a drop of this stuff in it, and it clears out all the bacteria, and you can drink it. You know, there's, there's things you can do like that. But they can't. They even say on the FEMA website they can't take care of us. Uh, and, it, you know, you can't. There's 7 billion people in the world. <laughs> you, how are you going to protect them? And even the most modern country like us, probably 100,000 people is all that they could uh, take care of in case of a disaster. Well, you, you know, you made two bo- uh, two comments in your book uh, the day after 2012, and one was that uh, once a civilization enters a digital age and the digital uh, electronics, technology, whatever, is disrupted, let's say with a solar flare or whatever, your history is totally wiped off at that time. And I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's quite you're quite right. Yeah, that'll, well, you that'll, know, uh, that'll be the end of the history. Yeah. Well, you think, you know, I'm not certain that we're the most advanced civilization ever to live on this planet. Because it only takes 500 years, and everything we built would have mm. rotted, decayed, and been gone. Yeah. The planet's, what, 4.6 billion years old? Mm-hmm. I mean, how do we know a billion years ago there wasn't an entire advanced civilization here? But when you get to the point of everything being electronic, and then it goes... What what record do you have back? As a matter of fact, the only thing, there's probably only two things that would be left right now if we were to get totally destroyed. Mount Rushmore, because it was carved in granite, uh-huh. and, and plastic bottles. <laughs> so probably <laughs> you know, people would find a plastic water bottle, you know, <laughs> under 10, 20 feet of, of uh, dirt. Uh, and then that's it. Outside of that, every building, every car, everything after 500 years is gone. But the pyramids would still be there, too. Yeah, yeah, those type. I mean, the yeah. pyramids in, in, in Rome, the Colosseum are in such bad shape. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, you, you probably, the pyramids would be under sand. You'd have to dig them up again. But as far as modern things, the yeah. only modern, yeah. let, let's put it that way, the only modern thing built in the last 200 years that would still be there sure. would be Mount Rushmore. 
That's pretty interesting, because perhaps the pyramids are what's left over from some ancient civilization. It was their Mount Rushmore, in a sense. Uh, mm. You know, yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I've always felt that there was something uh, here earlier, and a lot of the myths are not so much aliens, but from a prior civilization. Mm. But uh, well, oh. keep thinking of that movie, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, I, you yeah, know, I, I, yeah, you know, as a kid, yeah. I watched it. I loved it. Now I understand it uh-huh. that the simians would do anything to keep the truth away from the apes. That humans were here first and were able to speak, and that was so prophetic that that's the way the government and religion is. If you find something that doesn't fit the current theories, you cover it up, you throw it away, you don't bring out out of place information that changes everything because they don't want change. No, no, that that is the one thing with government. It, it's the constancy. It, it has to be constant. It has to be and religion and well, yeah, and religion too. But uh, well, I I I don't know, John. We've sort of come to the end of the hour, and well, uh, not the end. That not the, the end. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I sort of hesitate to wish anybody a merry Christmas or happy holidays after this hour. You well, know, I went to LA <laughs> Fitness right before getting on your show, and I signed uh-huh. up for three years. Okay, so I, I am positive something's going not going to happen. <laughs> okay, great. Other than I'll get in better shape. <laughs> okay, great to know. Thank you so much for being here. And again, for really fascinating reading, go to John's website, johnventre.com. Uh, Bill, Dave, as always, thank you so much for being here, for supporting the show. And let's hope we'll all still be here next Friday. Thank you for listening. You make the show even more interesting.